Mark 2. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, this is kind of a theme, right? Because, you know, um, even with the centurion who came and told him that his servant had been sick and he was going to die. And Jesus said, shall I go with you? And he says, no, I, I also am a man of authority and have people under me. I don't deserve to have you under my roof. Just say the word and he'll be healed. And Jesus said, I haven't seen such great faith. And what about the woman who, whose child had been possessed by demons, and, but she was not a Jew? And she said to him, you know, please come and heal my daughter. And he says, I, I've been sent to heal the, children, the lost children of Israel. It's not right to um, throw their food to dogs. And she didn't argue with him. She didn't say, like, how dare you call us that or anything like that. She said, even the dogs get crumbs from their master. And now you're seeing that they could not present the paralyzed man to Jesus, but what they did was they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then they lowered that mat that the man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. And what you see here is you see that there was the persistence of that woman. She didn't need to exalt herself. She was accepting the way that he was talking about her because, I mean, technically, you know, to hear that you're being equated to the dogs probably didn't feel real good. But I believe the symbolism there is one of humility and also of her perseverance. I mean, she was not really going to take... I don't know that she wasn't going to take no for an answer, but she was insistent that he is the master, like even using that, those words that she believed in him and that her solution was only going to come from him. And look, I mean, she was considered a foreigner. She wasn't even part of the Jews. He came to do, to do for the Jews and how many of the Jews even wanted him. So you know that I've been on this mission to understand what true faith is, um, but not just to understand it. You know, it's like not to understand it with my carnality. I want to understand it with my experience. I want an experiential repertoire. You understand what that means? It means like that is in my soul because what good is faith in my head? It's got to be in the center of my soul. Like that is in my heart. It's in my spirit. That's what's coming out of me. That's what I want. So I love that there's these three examples that he's giving me right now of faith so that I can understand like it's not, you know, he's looking at these people and the centurion didn't expect for him to come and put his hands on the servant. Same thing with the other centurion who said that his son was ill. At that very moment that Jesus said it, he was healed. And these people believed. They believed that it was that he could heal them without even having to show up, without even having to touch them. Just say the word and they'll be healed. The other thing I want to point your attention to is that the verse says, when Jesus saw their faith, verse 5, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins have been forgiven or your sins are forgiven. Well, why is he saying that if physical illness is separate from sin? I mean, it really blows me away, the deceptions that we have swallowed in counterfeit Christianity, the deceptions that are so based on the world and what the world tells us about our condition, and yet the word's been very clear. Why does Jesus keep saying to people, sin no more, repent, return to God and he will heal you, son, your sins are forgiven? They're not coming to him for that reason, are they? Aren't they coming to him for physical illness? You're living in a whole soul. You are living in a soul. You're not living in a body and then a mind and then a blah, blah, blah. It's all spiritual. It's all connected. And the core of what's going on with you is spiritual. Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, 
Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to a paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk, get up and take your mat and walk. I mean, think about that for a minute. What's easier to say? So they're ignoring the fact that Jesus healed him saying to a paralyzed man, get up and walk. And they're focused on this other thing that he has said, which is your sins are forgiven. Is him not getting up and taking up his mat and walking? Is that not the fruit of him being forgiven, of him being restored? You see this wickedness? You need to see it because it's not just for that time. This isn't just happening happening 2,000 years ago. This is happening today. Look at the fruit. That is going to tell you the truth. Don't rely on your own thinking because that's what they were doing. Relying on their own thinking, relying on the world, relying on their own justifications and what they want to believe. They didn't want to believe that he was the Messiah. Verse 10, but I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, let me help you out here. Is Jesus talking about a doctor? Or when Paul refers to Luke as the beloved physician, are they talking about doctors as we know them today? Because doctor would be kind of synonymous with healer, right? So Jesus, the Lord has already told us that he is the Lord, our healer. Jesus is not talking about people who give you medicines, who cut you open, who deny the creator in Darwinian evolutionary science, who, you know, use pharmacia, which was historically witchcraft. He's not talking about that. It would be synonymous with him saying, it's not the healthy who need a healer, but the sick. So don't mistake that. And when Luke is referred to as the physician, this is just a man who works with those who are physically ill, those who are bearing symptoms of physical illness. Now, is physical illness separate from spiritual illness? Of course not. That's not what the word would say. So would Luke then, having followed Jesus on his ministry and knowing exactly what Jesus taught regarding the spiritual nature of illness and him healing people and then saying, now sin no more, return to God, repent, would Luke have done something different? Of course not. Just like I in my world training, was a psychologist. I'm still working with the mind, but I'm not working with it according to my training, nor am I isolating the mind and thinking that what people have is mental illness. I understand where their illness has come from. I understand that it is a spiritual issue. And yes, I'm still working with people based on that niche because I understand it very well. But it doesn't mean that I'm a psychologist in the way that the world defines psychologist also doesn't mean that I'm the one who heals you. So I think this is the reason why, instead of saying healer, Jesus said doctor. Nevertheless, I don't take that position. Yes, I still hold my title as doctor, but that's not the position I am typically taking with you. I'm referring to myself as shepherd. I'm taking the lower position because I want to set an example for you and I don't want you to set me up as a world expert. So I don't even use that language anymore, do I? The only time that I use it in the book is because I debated on this and I questioned whether or not I should be identifying myself as doctor with the book or on some of the videos. And the reason I did it is because you guys seem to take me more seriously when I refer to myself as doctor. And so there's a lot of people who come to the channel or listen to me because of that. But the truth is, that is not where my wisdom comes from. And if you listen to what I say, if you listen to the way I talk, I make a mockery of it. I'm very clear with you that I don't believe in what the world teaches. 
that my credentials mean nothing because when God began to heal me, he told me that he was going to, that I was going to unlearn everything I thought I knew. And that includes my entire doctoral education. It was not only worthless to healing, but it did the very exact opposite of what it promised to do by leading me into the flesh and leading me into sin and leading me into idolatry and being set up as an idol. So don't let that trip you up whatsoever. It is referring to a role, not the same role as we define it today. It's simply referring to a doctor or a physician as, as one who works with the sick. Not because the body is separate from spirituality, but because one who is working with the sick would understand certain nuances about physical illness. Let me give you another example of that and then we'll move on. Another example of that is the body metaphor work that I do with you. Jesus spoke in parable, no reason he would stop. He established things in the natural, in the tangible, in order to help us to understand things in the spiritual. So when I am doing that work with you in the physical, and we're listening for the information that God is speaking in your body, well, that would be a nuanced niche, wouldn't it? It is relating to how spiritual issues manifest in the body. When I'm working with you regarding your trauma, your unresolved suffering, we are looking at how certain information is manifesting in the body and also in the mind. The spiritual and emotional dilemma of your soul, how that is manifesting, how is God speaking in parable in your body and in your mind? So it's important based on what I do, what the niche that he has built in me, that I understand both, but that I understand that at the core of that is spiritual symbolism spiritual truth that needs to be addressed. Verse 18. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. What Jesus is describing here, which I I talked with you in the video um, when we were reading Matthew, and what he's describing is this process of rebirth. In Ezekiel 36 through, uh, 36, 26 through 27, what you're seeing is that God is going to remove your heart of stone, the heart that's been defiled by the world, the heart that has ingested all of that garbage from the world, and he's going to place in you a new heart of flesh, a softened heart that's able to receive his teaching. And then he's going to place his spirit into your heart and he will move you to follow his laws and keep, and be careful to keep his decrees. These disciples are being reborn. There's a new, there are new wineskins that are being constructed in them in which Jesus is pouring new wine. Now, is he erasing everything? No, he's not erasing everything, but he's giving them a container, so to speak, that is able to hold this truth that's able to understand. The other part of this is that there is an aspect of mourning. We're supposed to be mourning our separation from him so that when we're fasting, we're getting in deeper with him. We're getting in closer with him. We're supposed to recognize that when we're living in the world so that his spirit begins to grieve us when we start to return to the world or we start to return to the flesh or we're stepping outside in in, in the slightest even way, in the slightest even way that we begin to mourn, we begin to feel like, oh, I'm missing him. I'm missing that closeness. I don't like how this feels. That's the reason we're fasting. We're circumcising from the sinful flesh, disciplining the physical flesh. And if you're actually doing that, because, you know, listen, I can talk to you all day about this stuff, but until you do it, you aren't going to understand the phenomenon. You won't understand anything I'm saying. If you fast, you will understand what I'm saying. Because what you're doing is you are circumcising from your sinful desires. You are disciplining your physical flesh, but you have to discipline your physical flesh according to something. Something has to discipline it. It can't discipline itself. 
And so you are getting into the heart and spirit where God communicates to you and where he cleans you up, where his presence, where you were told that his presence is going to be in your heart. And then he's going to move you to follow his laws and be careful to keep his decrees. So that when you're doing that, then you're able to feel God. Then you're able to get in deep with him. And this is why, you know, I say do those, the three days. I know sometimes people do like a fast here and there, like one day or, or whatever, Personally, if you have some major stuff going on and you're not feeling God, you need to do the three days. One day is barely going to scratch the surface. If you want to feel him, you need to do three days. In Hosea 6, uh, 1 through 2, he says, come, let us return to the Lord. Okay, that's what you're doing when you're fasting. You're returning to him. For he has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has wounded us but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us, okay? After two days, he will revive us. So you're gonna start to feel revived. And why revived? I, I, the way I feel that is that when you start returning to your flesh, the flesh is death. The things of the flesh are death. And so reviving is like being made live again. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his presence. This is what I have found personally. My personal testimony is by that third day, he restores. So if you're having trouble hearing him, if you're having trouble feeling connected to him, you need to do a fast. And the way to do that is to write down all of the things you've been placing before him, electronics, alcohol, worry, whatever it is, your own wisdom, I mean, self-idolatry is big, so you need to take a look at that. No binging on YouTube. You step away from all of it, and you listen to his voice for three days. It sounds hard, and it sounds like torture to those of us who have been living. I mean, that's sad, but I'm saying it like it is. It sounds like torture to those of us who distract ourselves with technology and whatever else we do. But is the best thing that you can do for your spiritual life is to return to him, and that's the thing he tells us to do. So Jesus says, but the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. And on that day, they will fast. The other thing is that fasting was associated, was always associated with mourning. It was something that people did in order to express their grief. But remember again, that those things were established in the, in the natural, in the tangible, in order to help us to understand the spiritual. But here's that aspect that I, that I want to get at is that I've told you before how important grief is to God. If you're not feeling your grief, you are not in touch with your powerlessness. You're not in touch with your need for God. You're not in touch with your fragility. And you're not capable of becoming humble. You might be able to feign humility. You might be able to, I mean, I've known plenty of people who are completely disconnected from their emotions who act like they're very meek and humble, but they're not. They're terrified. They're terrified of feeling. They're terrified of being exposed. They have a lot of anxiety about living in the design that God has given them because they don't understand their design. They just repress everything. It's very important to God that we are grieving and especially that we are experiencing godly grief regarding our own sin. And we're told by Paul that what that does is it leads to repentance. It leads to understanding of who we are, who he is, and what position we need to get into. So does God grieve us unnecessarily? No, but he does grieve us. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. So that is a message regarding what Christ is doing in his apostles. I've, I've told you before, God is not disorganized in, in his thought process. One thought is leading to another thought because they have to do with each other. So he's telling you something here. He's giving them new wineskins. He's giving them new wine. So what are those things? He is making, causing them to be reborn and he's pouring new wine into them. Just like When the father draws you to the son and the son starts proving himself to you and you actually receive that, you have begun the process of becoming a new creation. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and his disciples walked along. They began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, 
Look, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Okay, this is a little confusing. What does one have to do with the other? He said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Well, the son of man is a man right now as he's saying this, but he's the son of man. And so he's Lord, even of the Sabbath. Now look at what he said a few verses up, verse 25. Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? You realize that they didn't have like a frat house or something that they were hanging out in. They were traveling and sharing the gospel. And what he's saying right here is that they were hungry and in need. And in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, David entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which was only lawful for the, high, for the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Elsewhere in scripture, the, the Pharisees are questioning Jesus about why he's healing. Is it lawful to heal on the, on the Sabbath? And Jesus says, you know, if your sheep was in need, like if, you're, if something happened with your sheep, you would crawl in there and you would make sure that your sheep was okay. Why should I not heal a person who's been harassed by Satan? Why should I not free them of that on the Sabbath? It's good to do good on the Sabbath. It's good to feed those who are hungry and in need. And the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. This Sabbath is mine. If I want to do good on the Sabbath and I want to feed my flock who are hungry and in need, my sheep, if I want to give them food that is consecrated and is only lawful for priests to eat, well, then that's what I'm going to do. And who's our high priest, by the way? Jesus. So if Jesus, the high priest, is feeding his priests the consecrated bread, just because the Pharisees can't see it doesn't mean it's not lawful, right? So there's a lot of different aspects to this scripture here. I'm really enjoying this uh, study of the Gospels, and I'm so enjoying Mark because I'm not as familiar with it, even though we're talking mainly about you know the same events. I just love the different aspects. And it really just, it, it points to the brilliance of God that even though they're the same events, but there's like a different aspect of it, he just keeps teaching us some, I mean, it's not, it, it's done with intention. He keeps teaching us and here's another aspect and here's another aspect to learn. It's just no human being could have done this. So I love it, love it, love it. And I hope you do too. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And I'll see you in the next video.